Uh, good morning and welcome to the uh, Westminster Confession of Faith lecture this morning. I trust that you've had a blessed week and that the Lord has been uh, with you and you've delighted in Him. Today we continue on this study in <coughs> the Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 3, God's Eternal Decree. Uh, last week we saw how that God in eternity, by the counsel of His most and what holy uh, counsel of His own will, did freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. And we consider that that eternal decree of God, um, established in eternity, realized in time, is uh, in accordance with who He is, is His character, His being, uh, and is unchangeable and eternal. Today I want to come to chapter 3, part 3. Let me read it for you. By the decree of God, for the manifestation of his own glory, or his glory, some men and angels are predestined into everlasting life, and others foreordained to everlasting death. Now we come then to a subject this morning that has been uh, something of a hot potato in the life of the history of the church, um, created divergent views, um, caused consternation, um, even resulted in people's deaths. So it's not a, it's not a light-hearted subject in terms of how the church has picked it up and understood it. And of course, it is of immense importance to us because it reveals to us the way in which God has established the citizens of the kingdom that He is building that will dwell with Him in Christ and the Holy Spirit in eternity. The, the key word, the big word in this section is the word predestined. It's a word that causes palpitations in some people's lives. To such a degree that some people say, I, I, just, I can't deal with it anymore. It's just it's too much. I can't cope with the difficulty. I can't cope with the fact that there are people in my family who don't understand it, don't accept it, don't believe it. Uh, some of my friends, they are opposed entirely to it. Um, so I think it's best if we just leave it alone. It's never best to leave the doctrines of grace alone. Uh, what is best is to seek them out, understand them, and then having understood them, to try and seek to communicate what they are to other people. The first thing that we see is that this predestination is... Um, involves men and angels. That's not always understood. Uh, both men and angels have been predestined. Um, angels are created beings. So are men. And angels, whether they are in heaven or whether they are with Satan, are where they are today because God predestined them to be in that position. Men um, will be in eternity where God has predestined them to be. Now, this is where the clash comes in, because the clash revolves around the idea that, well, man has free will. Now, you'll remember last week that we looked at the issue of free will. So, how can God predestine that which is going to come to pass in the life of man if man has a free will. If God has decreed in eternity what man is going to ultimately choose in respect of his eternity, then how can that marry with the biblical truth that man has a free will to choose of his own fruition his own destiny in eternity? They seem to be mutually and exclusive. They seem to be unable to be able to stand side by side. Well, as we considered last Lord's Day, and just to remind you now, this term free will has to be defined in terms of the nature of man when he exercises that will. All men are free to choose what they want to do. That's a biblical truth. It's undeniable. But they are free to choose what they want to do 
within the constraints or the parameters of the nature that they own or possess. And we saw last, Lord, or last sorry, no, it wasn't last Lord's Day, it was last Saturday morning, although I did draw something of this into my sermon on the Sabbath morning. The fact is that man is in his natural state, is dead in his trespasses and sins. He has no desire to seek after God. He is at enmity with God. His mind is hostile. His heart despises the things of God, and his will has no interest at all in moving towards God. So, man is free in his natural state to do what he wants to do. But he will only do that which his natural state will allow him. And his natural state will not allow him to seek after God or to choose, as some would say, to accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Which then leaves us with, well, how does he become a Christian? And this is where the issue of predestination comes in. In eternity, God predestined those whom he had set his love on, those whom he had chosen, he predestined them to come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. Let me just read you from Ephesians chapter 1. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him. That's Christ. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. So God chose those who are going to be saved in Christ, and then he predestined them To be saved in Christ. It's clear. Can't dispute it. And so when someone is uh, converted, what happens is that the Holy Spirit works in their heart. He gives them a renewed mind, a regenerate heart. He moves their will towards God. He liberates them by making them into a new creation in Christ Jesus. And then that person, as a new uh, creation in Christ Jesus, then within that new nature, exercises the liberty of that free will that they have, and they will then receive and own the repentance and faith that God gives to them by grace. Removed from their previous natural uh, condition, of being under the condemnation of God and by nature of God's wrath, by by nature creatures of God's wrath or objects of God's wrath, God then sets them free in this new liberated uh, uh, nature that they have and they choose then within the context of that nature to come to faith in Jesus Christ accepting that faith that is given to them by God straightforward. Simple. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that God also uses a word foreordained. Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verse 7. In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our transgressions according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to the purpose which he has set forth in Christ. So, as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and on earth. The things in heaven and on earth that we have been set before us have been foreordained for us. They have been foreordained for us. And so what happens is that People who struggle with the concept of predestination say, well, there you have it. God foresaw, God foresaw the 
that men would choose Jesus. And because he foresaw that men would choose Jesus, he then, in that, based on that foreseeing, he then, as it were, re-engineered himself back into eternity and on the basis of his foreseeing of the actions and the decisions of men, predestined men to be in a position where they would do what they chose. So God is in eternity. He looks into time. He sees that men are going to believe in Jesus. And so he retraces his steps back into eternity. And he then predestines on the basis of what he sees. That's the way that that's interpreted. But that's, that's impossible. Because man in his original state cannot choose any spiritual life. He doesn't have the power to do so. The only power by which men can choose eternal life is from God. It's a gift from God. And that gift is given to man from God on the basis of God choosing before the foundation of the world on the basis of his love, not on the basis of man's acting, thinking, or behavior. Let me read again from Ephesians chapter 1. Even as, verse 4, even as he chose us in him, that's God chose us in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us for adoption through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. For the for, so the foreseeing of God foresaw man's salvation does not mean that God saw that man would choose man would choose Jesus or accept Jesus, and then on the basis of that foreseeing that God would then predestine man. Because that wasn't possible. Man cannot choose in a sinful state God. Man has no inclination to choose God. Man has no desire to choose God. Man has no capacity to choose God. Man has no ability to choose God. It is God who chose man. God chose man before the foundation of the world. God chose man because he loved him in Christ. God chose man and then he predestined on the basis of that choice to in time enable that man or that woman to receive a renewed mind, a regenerate heart, become a new creation in Christ Jesus, and so be free to exercise their will to believe and trust in Jesus Christ as he was offered to them in the gospel. So predestination does not mean, it is not done by foreknowledge. It is predestination and for knowledge. It is God who decrees who will be saved and who will not. Um, many people struggle with that, obviously. So if you're saying to me that it is God who chooses, then that means that I have no liberty. That's unfair. Well, God tells us in Romans chapter 9 that he chose not on the basis of any actions of man, but he chose on the basis solely of his love, as I've said. Romans chapter 9, he says concerning this salvation that he chose who he chooses because of his love. Uh, he speaks of Jacob and Esau, he says, um, though they were not yet born, speaking of Jacob and Esau, uh, and had done nothing either good nor bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of his call, she was told the older will serve the younger, and it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Election is another word that is used in respect of choosing the elect, the election. So that, that election, it was not based upon either what Esau or Jacob did. It was done before they were born. 
It was done solely on the basis of God's love. So God chooses people then simply on the basis of his love. Um, but what is, what is fair about that? There are people born into the world, and they have no hope of going to heaven. There are people born into the world, and they have no hope of going to hell. It has already been decided. God, before the foundation of the world, chose, by his eternal decree, elected a specific vast number of people, those who would join him in heaven, and those who would be cast into outer darkness and pain and grief and punishment of hell. How can God, as a God of love, think that, let alone do it? That's the question that's often posed. Where is the fairness in that? Well, I suppose that's a legitimate question, but it's a wrong question. The question that needs to be asked, why did God choose to elect any unto eternal life? When all mankind is deserving of eternal life. Uh, separation from him. Why would God, in eternity, make a decision to set his love on some, a vast number, of mankind who are born natures by, in terms of their nature, objects of his wrath because of their descendancy from Adam? Why would he choose to renew their hearts, regenerate their hearts and renew their minds, given that those hearts and minds were used to rebel against him for all the days of their life up to that point? Why would God choose to give them the liberty of a new created nature and so enable them by their free will to come to embrace by faith Jesus Christ, having repented of their sins, and so experience eternal life. Why would God do that? Why would God do that on the basis of sending His own Son from heaven to the earth to live in obedience under the law of God all the days of His life, subject to the same temptations as man is, yet without sin, to be taunted, mocked, teased, vilified, spat upon, ridiculed, physically uh, abused, and then to be put to death on a cross. To die a death which he should not have died because he shouldn't have died any death because he was not, without, he was not with sin. And sin is the consequence, or sin leads to death. We only die because of sin. So if Jesus did not sin, why did Jesus die? Well, Jesus died because the Father sent him to die. Why did the Father send him to die? The Father sent him to die so that the penalty due to those whom he had chosen in eternity would be paid. That God is a holy God. God is a just God. God is a God of love. Would then be in a position to, in love, declare through the penalty of Jesus paid that those who believe in him are declared right or just in his sight. And through the righteousness that Jesus obtained by his obedience during his life, imputed or given to those same people would make them upon their death holy and so able to enter into the kingdom of God. Why would God do all that? Surely that's unfair on Jesus. Jesus was holy. Jesus came to the earth. Jesus lived in the earth. Jesus committed no sin. Yet Jesus died, not for his own sin, but bore the penalty due to the vast multitude of those whom God chose or elected before the foundation of the world. If people want to talk about fairness as they speak in human terms, then 
asked them, but what was fair about God's dealing with his son? Jesus did it voluntarily. Men were uh, involved in the putting of Jesus to death. But God, as we saw last Lord's Day, in terms of eternal decree, permitted, foreordained, that man would do those acts. In so doing, he was not the author of sin, but he certainly for, uh, allowed and permitted those things to be done. He foreordained them. So if you want to talk about fairness, let's talk about fairness in respect of Jesus. In terms of what was fair for us, for all mankind, is that we should be sent out of the presence of God for all eternity. If you want to talk about human fairness, if you want to talk about that, that's what should have happened. If you want to talk about justice, that's what should have happened. Because God looked into the earth, Paul writes to the church at Romans says, and saw there was no one that was good. We all stand condemned because of the trespass of one man, Adam. So there isn't any excuse why we can say to God, that's not fair. And even if we wanted to say to God, that's not fair, God says in Romans chapter 9, Verse uh, 19, who will say to me, why does he still find fault? In other words, if you plan it all, if you predestine it all, why am I at fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will what is molded say to the molder, why have you made me in this way? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honored use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath and to make us power no man, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for his glory? And that brings us to the point. That brings us to the point. Why did God do this? Why did God predestine? choose a lack. The reason is for his own glory. God's glory is revealed in the fact that he set his love upon men who were not deserving of that love. God's glory is revealed and he sent Jesus to die on the cross to pay the penalty for that, that, that sin. And having attained to the righteousness because of his obedience that then would be imputed to them, God manifests his glory in the terms of what he does to every single human being who is going to be a believer in Jesus Christ, in that he shows them his mercy and grace at some point during their life. When they're spiritually dead, he gives them the gift of new life in Jesus Christ, and the Spirit of God applies the work of Christ finished at the cross to that individual's life. And God's glory is manifest. The rebel is turned into the lover. The rejecter is turned into one who believes and accepts. But God's glory is also revealed in the punishment that he brings upon the godless. Because if his glory is manifest through his punishing Jesus for the sins of those whom he will save, that also manifests his justice in the fact that he punishes them for their sin. And when he pours out his wrath upon those whom Jesus did not pay the penalty for, when God pours upon them what is justly deserving of them because of their sin and thought, word, and deed during their life, then his glory is revealed. His glory is declared. He's not a pernicious God. He's not a God who can be bribed. He's not a God who is arbitrary. He is a God of perfect character, perfect love, and he is a God of perfect justice, punishing his son for the sins of those who are elected unto life and punishing the sins of those whom he elects justly 
unto eternal separation from him. Now, that's important. We have to understand these things because there is much confusion. And we never want to score points of other people. We never want to have knowledge just to simply tell other people what we think because we know they're wrong. There are believers in Jesus Christ, lovers of God, godly people who do not understand this truth. And with love and patience, we need to speak with them in a way that will help them come to an understanding of these truths. Because there's a consequence to our understanding of God's choosing. Angels and men elect unto life. Angels and men elect unto eternal separation. There's a consequence for that. There's a psychological consequence for that. If you know that you have been chosen before the foundation of the world in the love of Jesus Christ, and that you've been adopted in Christ before the foundation of the world, and that you're in that position not by virtue of what you are, say, or do, but you're in that position by virtue of what Jesus was, is, says, and does. And you're in that position because of God's love then that is phenomenally liberating. It is so important to our psychological well-being that we understand that God loves us because we are all a mixture and a flux of difficulties, concerns, anxieties. And we need to constantly fall back on this truth. I am loved of God. I have been chosen to prefer the foundation of the world. I have been blessed in Jesus Christ. I am adopted by the perfect will of God into this community of God's people. And I am because of God loves me. And he loved me for the foundation of the world so that it, God's love for me is not now dependent on what I'm doing, thinking, or saying. What I think, say, or do now is important because it manifests my understanding of God's love for me. And if I love God deeply, I will want to obey Him. If I understand that I have been chosen, predestined, elected before the foundation because of His love for me, then I will want to reciprocate in every way I can. For those who won't accept this truth at present, who believe that they accepted Jesus by somehow stirring spiritual life in themselves, the real wrestle they have is that when they had a difficulty, they have in the back of their head, I love God. I came to God. I accepted God. It's because of who I am that I knew God. And so when trial and difficulty comes, they are not thrown back onto God's love where we should always dwell but they are left with confusion. They're left to a degree dysfunctional. They're left thinking, well, what am I going to do? I accepted God. God's waiting in heaven for me to respond, and I don't feel like responding. I don't feel as if I can respond. I don't feel as if I have the energy to respond. This difficulty is taking everything out of me. I have nothing left to give. Am I going to be lost? Whereas if you understand the doctrines of grace, the eternal decree of God, the truths of predestin predestination, foreordination, choosing, election, if you understand them in a biblical way, you'll never be in that territory. You'll never be under that fear. And so this is not just about doctrinal exactitude doctrinal correctness. This is about our lives, about our well-being, about our ability to cope in the knowledge that God loves us. And that's why we need to be extremely gentle, gracious, 
kind and patient with dealing, when dealing with brothers and sisters in Christ who have not come to a full understanding of this in, the, in their lives yet. Let us never be proud or arrogant. Let us always be uh, gentle and persuasive that we might help them come to an understanding of these things, that they might experience what we experience. Well, with that, I leave it for today. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that before the foundation of the world, because of your love for us, you chose a vast number, a number so vast that it is greater than the sand on the seashore, the stars in the sky. You predestined those whom you chose in love to be conformed to the image of Christ. You predestined and elected them that they would, by the work of the Spirit in their lives, come to faith and believe in Jesus Christ through the creation of a new nature within them. And so, be at liberty then to choose to embrace the repentance and faith of those twin graces that you give to all who would come to you. Help us to understand these things. Help us to understand them because they are truth. Help us to understand them because they come to you, from you to us for a purpose. Help us to understand them because they set us in the context of a safe place, a place where your love uh, is preeminent. And give us understanding hearts and understanding ears and patience to, in love, deal with brothers and sisters in Christ who as yet do not understand this. Lord God, do not keep us from speaking with them. Never, go with, never have within us an attitude, I'll just leave it. It doesn't matter. Help us to see that it does matter. And whilst we have to wait for an opportune time, it does matter. It doesn't matter in terms of their salvation because that is in Christ. It is fixed, settled. But it matters for them in terms of their life, their feeling of security and safety, their emotional stability, their psychological well-being. So we bless you this day that you've loved us in Jesus. And help us to love all who are in Jesus and profess to be in Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.